It's time. Okay. Well, welcome. I'm glad to see you all here today. This is the first presentation in the Horton School of Music and Performing Arts Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Intersection Series, where we explore the intersectionality of music, culture, and faith. I wish we could be together in person, and next time I think we will be. I cannot imagine a better way to kick off this important series than with today's guest. In fact, when I first conceived this series, though I do have to tell you that Dr. Lewis is the one who came up with the name to really reflect what our purpose is. Today's guest was the person I immediately thought to invite. So with that, I'm going to ask Professor Mark Sturbank to introduce today's guest. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, you all know me in the Horton School of Music at CSU as Professor Mark Sturbank, Associate Professor of Music, Director of Jazz Ensembles and Instructor of Saxophone. However, it is also my privilege to be known for many years as friend, brother, collaborator, bandmate, and saxophonist for our guest speaker today. It's an honor to introduce him to you, though many of you may already know him or have seen him perform around Charleston. He's the former and founding director of the Charleston Jazz Orchestra, artist in residence emeritus at the Gilliard Center, um, organist and choir director at St. Patrick's Catholic Church downtown, and member of the Grammy Award winning local group Ranky Tanky. He is a gifted performer, educator, trumpeter, pianist, vocalist, composer, arranger, conductor, and band leader. He is also one of my very best and closest friends. Please welcome Mr. Charlton Singleton. Thanks, Mark. Uh, thank you all um, for uh, the invitation. Um, yeah, Mark, that's a lot of stuff. <laughs> um, so um, before we before we go any further, uh, we've got to say a quick prayer. Um, Lord, we thank you for this day and just for another opportunity to say the words, thank you, Lord. Um, I thank you for the many blessings of what you've bestowed upon all of us. We ask that you continue to bless uh, the uh, students, the faculty and staff at Charleston Southern University. And Lord, finally, as we continue uh, as a group and as uh, individuals to uh, walk in the light and, and, and walk in faith uh, and get into your word, we always ask that your word get into us. In your son, Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. Uh, so now I have mostly done Zooms with, um, with folks asking about Ranky Tanky or something specifically about jazz. Um, but honestly, I really uh, don't do a whole lot where they, you know, just say, come on and talk about, you know, you, come on and talk about me. Um, but Mark will tell you, and uh, some of you that others that are on here that know me uh, will, will, uh, will attest to this, that I am a talker and um, a, a sort of a storyteller. It's all in the blood. And then um, and I'll get into, into that as we go. Um, so um, with that said, um, I'll start by just telling you about um, growing up. Um, I was born in Allwindaw, South Carolina. If you're unfamiliar about where Allwindaw is, it is right next to Mount Pleasant. Um, Within the Alwanda community, I am from, uh, or the town of Alwanda, I am from the Ten Mile community. Now, the Ten Mile community is, um, if you want a landmark, um, right now, the Ten Mile community starts just past where Wando High School is. If you're still going north, if you're any of you all are familiar with that area out there, um, there is a subdivision just past the stoplight to where you would turn into the new Wando High School. Um, and I still say new Wando High School because I went to the old one. <laughs> um, but uh, just past that is Whitehall Terrace. It's a subdivision. And then there's also uh, Darrell Creek, I think that you go the other way. 
but there was an old building called the Berkeley Electric Co-op building that is right next to Whitehall Terrace. And there's a road that goes right, that sort of separates those. Now, everything coming back towards Mount Pleasant, including Whitehall Terrace has a Mount Pleasant address. Everything from that Berkeley Electronic, uh, Berkeley Electric building going north towards, um, well, it's that's where Alwinda starts. And my parents' house are, is literally two blocks uh, past that. So that's why we had an Alwinda address. And um, the school lines always went all the way up to Siwi Road. If you lived in Mount Pleasant and your house was all the way up to Siwi Road, that was where the cutoff was. You went to Mount Pleasant schools. Anyone from Siwi Road on Siwi Road and going further up went to schools in uh, Alwanda or in McClellanville, such as uh, Lincoln High School, um, for as a matter of fact. Um, uh, yeah, LA, that's what it's called now, LA, Lower Alwanda. Um, actually, I think Quentin was the one that came up with that, that term, you know, using it whenever we would play. Um, but yes, that's where I'm from. Um, when I, um, my first recollections of just growing, of, of, of being, you know, on this earth um, actually started with music. Uh, when I was young, I got really sick somewhere around two years old or something like that. And I remember my parents uh, had bought me a little toy xylophone or something. That's my very first recollection of music. Now, um, one other thing that my parents tell me, though, and this is something that, um, that they bring up quite a bit uh, as being the start of things, um, my grandfather, uh, my father's father, who's Edward Singleton, used to always do this thing with all of his grands and great grands. And we come from a, a large family on that side. Like, um, like my father is the eighth of 10 kids. I am the last grandchild and my number is 55. Um, we also have triple digit great grands and triple digit great great grands now. Um, that's just dad's side of the family. But one thing that that my grandfather, Big Daddy was what we called him, would do is he would sit us down and uh, or sit us in front of him and he would do this little game where he'd clap this rhythm and he'd stomp his feet and he'd sing this little two words to us, jump, baby, jump, you know, he would just, you know, jump, baby, jump, jump, baby, jump, jump, baby, jump. And of course, all of us being as old as we were to, you know, just enough to be able to stand, I guess, is when you started doing this up until you were probably about four years old, I'd say four or five years old and everybody would be jumping up and down and then he would say fall baby fall and then you would you know everybody would dive on the floor and it was a big laugh because you know you're playing with your, your granddad you know and he was doing that thing now my parents have gone on record and said that they think that that's my first music lesson and when I think back about it nowadays um I um it starts with this rhythm We'll get more into this rhythm. And he would keep just a steady beat. I don't know if you can hear, but I'm, I'm sort of you know, just doing four on the floor with my foot. And he would sing this other rhythm. Jump, baby, jump, baby, jump, fall, baby, fall. And so that was, that was uh, one of my, you know, first recollections of of any type of music. Now, Big Daddy in our neighborhood, uh, 10 Mile, um, and for and all of the other miles for that matter, um, were all very much um, close-knit African-American communities. Um, 10 Mile, uh, and, and all of these, all of these communities get their names because they are 
the proximity to the foot of the bridge of, of the Cooper River Bridge or the Arthur Ravenel Bridge. So um, there's the Four Mile community, which is sort of around Venning Road, if you're familiar with Mount Pleasant, um, because it's about four miles from the foot of the bridge. There's the Six Mile community, there's the Seven Mile community, there's the 10 Mile community, there is the 21 Mile community, which is way past Siri Road. Um, and so uh, these communities um, being very much African-American communities, they were very uh, family oriented. You usually had two or three families that were sort of the, you know, the bulk of that community. And um, sometimes you would get families that married, you know, into those families or whatever have you, such as like, you know, what happened with my parents growing up in um, opposite ends of the, or, you know, of the block. You know, my, fa my father grew up on Gadsonville Road. My mom grew up on uh, Lucian Drive, which is off of Beehive Road. And so um, these communities though, were very much um, tight knit. They were family oriented. And all of these communities, you probably would find at least one church. And in our case, we had Greater Zion AME Church. And that's the church that, uh, that's our family church, the church that I grew up in. Um, now, my grandfather, Big Daddy, um, was really sort of the spiritual leader of the community and, and of this church. Sure, there's the pastor that would be assigned to the church and everything, but you still had usually sort of a, a senior member of the church that everyone would look to. And Big Daddy was that person in our community and at our church. Um, everyone that was a member of the church was assigned a class leader. And the class leader would visit you when you were sick in addition to the pastor, the class leader, um, would just uh, sort of um, be your, your sort of spiritual kind of advisor, if you will. Big Daddy um, was a class leader, but I always maintain that he was the class leader for everybody. He visited everybody. He never drove, he never uh, rode a bicycle. He walked everywhere in, ta in, in uh, the, the community. And from what I understand from my father, when my father was growing up, uh, Big Daddy would literally walk to uh, the foot of the bridge in order to, uh, he was a farmer, so he would take his, um, whatever his, um, whatever his harvest crop was, and he would go to the foot of the bridge and they would take the ferry back then, go over and he would sell, you know, his, his, um, his vegetables or whatever he was growing at that particular time. So Big Daddy walked everywhere he went. He walked um, to everybody's house and visited you if you were sick. Um, and so um, he had that knack of being labeled the spiritual leader. Now at church, um, you, you had to be involved. Our church was uh, probably a good medium size. I'd say it was probably about um, I'd say maybe about, uh, on, on a regular Sunday and it being packed in church, you could have about 300 people or so. It was a good size little church for this little community, but everyone had large families. And, um, one of the things that I remember specifically about growing up being that young was that we had this really big youth department, even though we had um, you know, this, this, this church that was packed and all of our aunts and uncles and leaders of the church and everything, the youth of the church were very large in number. And our parents and aunts and uncles and all of the, the, um, the adults that ran the church made sure that we were involved. And when I say we were involved, I mean, we had a youth choir that was um, close to 30 kids. We had a youth usher board. The youth usher board was about 20 of us. Um, and we would constantly have something going on, uh, even though we would sing or they would sing and we would, I was an usher um, 
um, but we would do the second and the fourth Sundays. We always rehearsed, um, which is something if you're a, a music teacher or a, if you're a band leader or something like that, you know, there's nothing like rehearsal. There was always something for us to do. And we were always at church, it seemed like. Uh, we were rehearsing. If it was just rehearsing how to take up the collection, that was something that we went to rehearsal for as, you know, in the usher board. Uh, the choir was always learning some new songs. Um, one Sunday, they, they would do one Sunday a year. It would be nothing but the choir. It would just be a whole concert. And the pastor, uh, this particular pastor would frame his whole uh, message and the readings of the scripture and everything around whatever the, you know, the, he would frame the, the choir's repertoire around all of that. Um, so uh, at a very young age, um, I was introduced to uh, Jesus Christ. My father being a minister himself, um, when he got his first church, I was, I believe I was two years old. And um, <clears throat> my parents weren't very strict people. Um, we knew what they expected of us and they had rules and everything, just like any you know, good parenting household. But the number one thing that you, you know, that was just from the get-go, you knew that our house was gonna serve the Lord. That was my father's number one thing. And it still is. Um, as a matter of fact, I, <laughs> I think he, he used to have a, he used to have a um, voicemail for the house answering machine. Um, it would, you'd pick up and it would say, um, this is the Singleton residence. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord leave a message at the people, you know. <laughs> um, and so uh, at an early age, it was just understood. Um, one of the things that I remember from being that young was that anytime we sat down to have dinner, we always would have to recite a Bible verse. Um, and um, the, the running thing about that or the running joke about that was that my, my brother, me, I'm the youngest, my brother would always, um, he would always try and get away with saying the same Bible verse. He just wanted to eat. So he would just say, Jesus wept. And, <laughs> and my sister, my, or, or it would start off with my sister being the oldest and she would say some long Bible verse or whatever have you. And then my father would say, all right, you're up. And then my brother would go, um, Jesus wept. And then he would grab his fork <laughs> And, and my sister would lose it and she would go, why does he always have to do that? We're always learning. And even me, you know, being two years old or three years old, you know, um, my first Bible verse that I remember uh, having to memorize was, um, for he was wounded by our transgressions. That's, that was, that was the length of it right then. And then um, uh, all we like sheep have gone astray. Um, so those are the first ones that I can remember um, saying at the dinner table. But my brother, uh, still even to this day, that's his running joke about the Jesus web. Um, but that's how we were raised. That's how my parents um, instilled the Lord into us. Um, we were active at church, absolutely. Um, and um, we were active in things we did at home as a family. Uh, with our faith, such as that example of just, you know, right before we break bread, saying a little, you know, Bible verse. That was sort of our devotion, if you will. My father's first church uh, was actually two different churches. Uh, they call it the circuit. It was um, Mount Zion AME Church and, um, oh gosh, um, it'll come back to me. It'll come back to me. But he would go to Mount Zion on first and third Sundays. And then, oh, St. James, that's it. St. James on second and fourth Sundays. And these churches were literally a mile apart, maybe, maybe two miles apart. But um, for whatever reason, and I don't know, 
the membership in them was not a, you know, very, very big. Even though the Mount Zion church was bigger in size, um, in, in terms of this, the structure of the church, it wasn't a very, um, it wasn't a very uh, big church population wise. And um, this church was located in the metropolis of Davis Station, South Carolina. Now, if any of you all know where Davis Station is, raise your hand. All right. Davis Station is up around the Sumter area. Sumter, and uh, if you're ever driving on, on I-95 and you see a weird town named Alkaloo or anything like that, um, it's a tiny, tiny little town. One of those ones where if you, once you get on the little back roads or whatever have you, and you get into town, if you, if you blink while you're driving through it, you're gonna miss it. It's that, it's that tiny. Um, it is about a two hour drive from our house to get to that church. And that is our commute every Sunday morning for, dad was there, I think for three years, three years. Yeah. I think he got it down. I think he found, um, a few shortcuts, but still, I think that maybe trimmed it to an hour and 45 or something like that. But that was our commute. That was my father's, as he would say, that was my charge. And, uh, and he was going to keep his charge. And so every Sunday morning, we would all load up in our car and we would drive to Davis Station and we would go to church. Um, when I think I was about five, I think around 1976 or so, he got a different church. This church is now in Georgetown, South Carolina. So it goes from the hour and 45 that he shaved down to about 45 minutes. Um, but still, um, same thing, um, very faithful with my father and, and, and going, you know, he never complained about asking for a church that was closer to the house or anything. Wherever, uh, if you know anything about the AME church, the bishop is the one that assigns all of the ministers to um, whatever church. And um, if you're a young minister, you're probably going to get, you know, whatever. You just want your first church. So you're probably going to get a church that might not be necessarily close to you. And... Um, uh, so my father uh, took on that church and um, uh, in Davis Station, and then we were at Arnett AME Church, and uh, it was at Arnett that I think um, we were there the longest time um, for a number of years. Um, but uh, still, the whole thing, load up in the car, drive 45 minutes instead of, you know, just going right around the corner or maybe even 15 or 20 minutes, if you will, to the other side of town here in the low country. Um, quick note, he did end up getting a church <laughs> later on in his career downtown, in downtown Charleston. Um, but I think he was only there for two years. Um, anyway, so, um, Going back to me a little, and I'm and I can jump all over the place because sometimes I, I, I get on one topic and then I, you know, jump from that topic and then I come back or whatever have you. That's that's just a, 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 a curse I have. But it was at Mount Zion, uh, in Davis Station that I actually gave my first performance ever. Um, now this is when I was about three years old. And um, all of this really kind of sets up um, me and what I do as a musician, I think, um, um, to this day. My sister is 10 years older than me. My brother is seven years older than me. So when they were 13 years old and 10 years old, re uh, respectively, and I was three, we had a music teacher that would come to our house. This man, his name was Mr. Marvin Sanders, and he taught music 
uh, along with uh, or at the same school that my parents worked at. My, my parents both worked at Lincoln High School. Uh, mom was the librarian, dad taught electricity. And Mr. Sanders would come to our house and he would give my sister and my brother piano lessons. Now, me being the, um, the, the baby of the family, and you know, when you're three years old, you're very impressionable and your job in the house is basically to run around, bother people, eat, um, mess things up, that's, that's what you do. Um, that's all you know how to do and you do it well. <laughs> you bug your, your siblings. If any of you all have younger siblings, you understand. If you have older siblings, they understand. <laughs> but when my brother and sister would take their lessons, my sister would have to take the lesson first and she would go for 30 minutes and my brother had to sit next to them in a chair you know, um, off of the piano, aside from the piano bench, and he would watch and observe. And then after 30 minutes, they would switch. So for that full hour, I didn't really have anybody to play with or, or run around in the house with or bother or whatever have you. And so I would run in and out of the room. Um, this was in our family room, we had the piano. I'd run in and out of the room. I would, you know, make noises, you know, to try and get attention. I would stand next to the piano and, you know, turn away from them, you know, so that they couldn't see my face. But, you know, in a three-year-old's mind, you know, I'm like, they can't see me, you know. <laughs> um, I would, uh, you know, hit one of the keys or something like that and run out of the room. And so after a while of this, my father stopped me and he said, listen, you, you, you can't keep doing that because it's, it's interfering with them learning. So I tell you what, how about I put a chair at the back of the room right here and you can sit in here and watch them. And really that's all I really wanted to do was just be near my brother, big, big sis, and big bro. Yeah, I just, I just wanna be wherever they are. I wanna feel like the big kid. Now remember, when you are three years old, you are extremely impressionable. And everything that you see adults do or, or how they act sometimes, you tend to copy what it is that they do. And so one of the rules that my father said was, you know, I couldn't make any noise. I couldn't stand up or, you know, walk in and out or, you know, so I would literally sit on my hands and I would just watch intently. But when my sister and my brother were taking their lesson and they were just beginning, so they were just trying to find all of the, the notes in the beginning. And one of the exercises that Mr. Um, Mr. Sanders started doing was he would say, okay, I want you to find all of the, all of the C's. So then they would have to... They would have to do that. And whenever they would move their hand, whatever way, I would be sitting at the back of the room and I would, you know, it's just sort of, whatever movement they did was the same movement I did. Now, um, here's something else about that, um, that I don't, I don't know how to, I don't know how to tackle it, but I think that being three years old and being that focused on my brother and sister and that particular exercise that they would always do, I think that's what sort of fine-tuned or jump-started the whole thing about me being able to have perfect pitch. I, I, that's, that's my thought about it. Um, I've, I've read so many things about people saying that you are born with it and, you know, if you are, you, you can develop it or whatever have you. If that's the case, I think that's the beginning of my development on that because it was a specific exercise of find all the A's. <laughs> you know, that was a specific thing. So while they're taking their lesson and while they're doing all of this um and i am laser i am tunnel vision you know even as a little three-year-old just watching my big sister and my big brother 
um, as, as a couple of weeks go on, I am really starting to get into just, you know, sitting there and watching. Now, when they would finish and they would go to their room or they would leave and go outside or whatever have you, now is my turn to jump up on that piano and start to just anything that I remember, you know, of what Mr. Sanders said or of what my brother and sister did, I tried. And I eventually picked out something that they did. It was probably a, a very simple, very simple song. It could have been two measures long, you know, it was that beginning, you know, probably John Thompson, you know, book one or, you know, lesson number two or whatever. It could have been that. But that was the beginning. And when I did that one day and my father heard it and recognized that my sister and brother had been doing that same thing, he went to school and he sought out Mr. Sanders and said, Charlton did this thing at the house. The next time that you're here, I need you to watch what he did. And so the next time Mr. Sanders comes, my father grabs me and, you know, just like, just like we do with our kids when we're proud of them, you know, go ahead, show them what you did, you know, <laughs> you know. And so I sit down and I start to, you know, do whatever it was. And my father looked at Mr. Sanders and says, is he too young to start taking piano lessons just like Charnett and Czechia? And Mr. Sanders said, well, I can start him off with some very basic things. We could do like a 10 minute lesson. That's about the attention span of a three-year-old, but that's how I started. And all of that within maybe about two months after the beginning of that, my parents bought me this little toy organ. It only had about, um, I don't know, maybe 20 keys on there, maybe an octave and a half or something like that. And um, it also had um, 12 little buttons on the other side. And these 12 little buttons were all of the, all of the, um, the musical notes um, in a major triad and all of the musical notes in a minor triad. And so it came with this book and you basically just matched the triad and you could play a song and get, you know, something simple. So that leads back to my first performance when I was three years old at Mount Zion AME Church in Davis Station, South Carolina, and I played Amazing Grace. <clears throat> I mean, it was, it wasn't, uh, <laughs> It wasn't a huge production or anything. It was more like a... You know, very block chord like that, you know? And I finished and, you know, I had my big bow tie on and, you know, my big Afro since we were in the seventies back then. And, you know, I finished and jumped off and, you know, took my big, big bow, <laughs> you know, but that was the start of, uh, of playing in church. Um, little did I know how um, significant of a moment that was at that particular time. Um, as I got older, I started to play some other instruments like the violin, um, which, um, was where my violin teacher, this was fourth grade, told me or discovered, if you will, that I had had perfect pitch. Um, at that time, uh, by the time I got to fourth grade, we had already switched piano teachers. And this different teacher, um, he was very, um, he was very stern with me in, in learning how to play. Um, uh, he, he had the mindset that he was going to groom me to become a concert piano player. And so one of the things, um, even, and, and I still talked about this, um, quite now, one of the things that he told my parents while basically looking at me and talking to my parents over there, he said, Reverend and Mrs. Singleton, make him practice. 
even if it's the most god awful sound or music you have ever heard, make him practice. And if you make him practice right now, you are going to be begging him to stop later on. And um, I'll get back to that because that happened. Um, but uh, I'm now in strings and I don't know anything about what perfect pitch is or, or whatever have you. But the first thing that you do in string class is you tune. And one day my teacher, she told a student, she said, play your A for me because you, know, you tune on the A string. And uh, whoever this, I don't remember the name of the student, but they played and it was, it was more like A sharp. You know, it was just really, it was, it was sharp. At least it was sharp to me. And so um, me being the, the bratty little, you know, know-it-all music kid that I was at that particular time, I yelled over at the kid and said, she said, play A, you're not playing A, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and Miss Household, that was her name at the time. She's Ezel now, Miss uh, Annie Zell. She lives in Columbia. Um, but um, she said, What do you mean he's not playing A? I'm looking at him. He's playing on the A string. And I said, Well, that's not A. And so she went over to the piano and she played the A and then found out that it was a little sharp. And she looked at me and she said, okay, play this. And she turned around or, or tell me what this is. She turned around and that was the beginning of it. And honestly, I didn't really know what it was, what it meant or how to, you know, how I could utilize it or anything. Um, even though I was heavy into music at that time, uh, I was still a little kid and my main focus was playing baseball, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, so that comes about in the fourth grade. Sixth grade, now we're into trumpeting and joining the high school band or joining the middle school band. Um, but all the while, all of this is going on, piano is still constant. And my piano teacher, like I said, is ramping it up. And um, because my father is the pastor of a church and I am the, I am the de facto assistant organist, um, and if the organist doesn't make it to church, then it's now falling on me. Uh, my father decided that he was going to ask uh, my new piano teacher, Mr. Ralph Wise, the late Mr. Ralph Wise. Um, he said, uh, I notice you have an organ in your, in your studio. He had a pretty big studio um, and um, rehearsal space that was on the, cor the corner of King and Queen Streets downtown. Every Saturday from when I was probably about five or six years old up until when I was maybe 16 or 17, that's where you, you could find me every Saturday at noon. Um, and he had a big um, kind of Hammond, or not Hammond, I'm sorry. He had like an Allen organ. I don't think it was an Allen, but it was something similar or comparable to an to an Allen organ in his studio as well. Um, and so for a little while, he started giving me organ lessons, um, maybe for about three months or so. And um, and the majority of those organ lessons were basically um, more than I think about it now. Just about some of the the technique, uh, it's, a, it's a little, it's a different technique of playing organ versus playing a, a real piano. Um, just little things like, you know, leaving my, my fingers down, you know, because I don't have a sustain pedal or whatever have you. Um, but just uh, little, little things, little tricks of the trade like that. Um, and so uh, getting back to band, I had already knew music for the most part. I could read music very well. Um, I knew some theory about it, right, Mark? Um, <laughs> Mark, Mark and I always talk about theory. Um, I don't like talking about theory. Mark always gets me on theory. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so starting off in band was relatively easy for me. I just needed to learn the proper technique and embouchure in order to get a sound out. Um, 
And uh, that was pretty much the, the hardest thing that I had to do. Learning what the notes are, already been there and already had done that. I could, I could read that easily. I could read treble clef, I could read bass clef, all of that. Um, one of the exercises that my, that my middle school band director asked me to do was to basically try to get me to produce a good sound. And he said something to me. He said, I want you to go home. I want you to stand in front of this a clock that's got a second hand. And I want you to go around, watch it go around three times. So you got three minutes and you're going to do this exercise. And he would just play this one note and just do and you would take it down. Marshall is basically like Remington. You know, so he would he, he just did that and he 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 showed me and and I stopped him about about 15 seconds into it and I said, Mr. Smith, with all due respect, that's the most boring thing that I've ever heard in my life. And he said, trust me, I'm your teacher. Trust me on this. I wouldn't tell you something on purpose that's not going to help you. I'm your teacher. This is what I'm here to do. You have to trust me on this. And I'm going to ask you about it tomorrow to see if you did it. So I went home and I knew that he would ask me. And one other thing in our house was that whatever the teacher said, that's law. Being that my parents were both educators, that's law. And you don't lie. And so I cannot walk in there and tell any teacher of mine that I had done something when I actually didn't. And also I knew just from piano playing that if I said that I had practiced and then he would say, show me, he could tell if I practiced or not. And so I would sit there in front of that clock and I would do that exercise and I was so concentrating on trying to make sure that the, the time went on, you know, that I didn't notice that I was actually getting better. So after about a week of doing this, I was able to do it. And it really kind of shocked me because he called on me one day just randomly in class and he said, play something. And I played this note and my eyes got really, really, really big because I, I didn't I just couldn't believe that that had happened. Um, but when I look back now and I think about that's the trust that I had had in Mr. Smith and, um, and how he said, you know, just trust me, you know, this is gonna work. You just have to give it, you have to give it a chance like that. Um, and from that moment on, anytime Mr. Smith would tell me something, I was like, I'm trusted. I got my faith and trust in Mr. Smith and what he says musically, that's going to work. Same thing with Mr. Wise playing the piano. Um, so band comes along. Um, I become this, you know, huge, you know, lover of, of band. Um, and uh, piano is still there. Um, at this point in middle school, what Mr. Wise told my parents about making me practice has all come back around to just like he said. I would come home from middle school, drop my books at the door, go in the kitchen, grab as much food as I can get in my one load, put it on top of the piano, go back, grab a big glass of Kool-Aid or whatever it was, and I would sit it on top of the piano and then I would sit down and for the next two hours, at least, I was practicing on some, I mean, just. Often All of that stuff, um, playing on. Anything that Mr. Wise said, you need to practice this, we're gonna have a recital. You need to know it by memory on, you know, two weeks from now, got it. And I am off and running. Um, 
to the point that my mother still to this day says that the piano was uh, my babysitter. Nowadays, we have kids that are unfortunately, they, they have video games and things like that. Um, you know, back then I had an Atari, but for me, it was all about, you know, sitting down at the piano and playing and playing. Also, something else I would do, I would get the phone. We had a very long cord and I would call up my friends and I would say, hey, what are you doing? All right, listen to this. And I would put the phone down and then I would play mm. for them. Um, depending on, on, on whose house it was, um, I would call and sometimes I would play TV show themes. Sometimes I would play pop songs. Sometimes I would play hymns. It just depended on whose house I was calling or, you know, or, you know, if they weren't there, you know, I would ask their, their parent or whoever answered the phone, listen to this, you know. Uh, what? Oh, yeah. Um, I remember calling one, one uh, friend of mine and um, his mom was like the, the songstress of the choir. Um, she was like the, the first Sunday choir, you know, senior choir leader. And on first Sunday, they always sang, what a friend we had in Jesus. So I would say, well, you know, listen to this, Ms. Jenkins. You know, I'd play for her or whatever have you. But that was the beginning of what I think and look back now as a sort of performance career. Um, and it always kind of goes back to church. And I say that because um, being my first performance was at church. Um, learning how to follow other musicians at church. Uh, sometimes learning songs on the fly at church. Um, I remember one, one Sunday, uh, I was sitting in the congregation and um, this gentleman, our organist, his name was Rodney. Rodney um, had had car trouble or something and I'm sitting there and I was in high school at the time, but I'm sitting there and I'm looking at my watch and I'm like, all right, it's five minutes till 10. Rodney's not here. Come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on. It's five minutes till 10. All right, it's three minutes till 10. Come on, come on. And then I'd usually get a tap on my shoulder and it would be one of the ushers and they would say, Reverend Singleton told me to come down here and tell you that you know what to do. And that was the key to get up and go on the organ and wait for the opening processional. This one particular Sunday, there was one of the choir members that came up to the choir loft instead of marching in. And he said, he said, uh, we're gonna sing, Father, I stretch my hands to thee. Now, Father, I stretch my hands to thee is one of those songs that can be mixed or can be performed in a bunch of different, with a bunch of different melodies. You can stick those words in a lot of different melodies or use them in a lot of different um, you know, meters, if you will. And um, he said, we're going to sing, Father, I stretch my hands to thee. And I said, okay, okay. And then he said, we're going to do it the old time way in odd meter. And I said, um, okay. And they started singing it. And I was just totally, totally, totally lost. Um, they kept on singing. I sat there at the organ and tried to follow them for, I think, a verse and maybe a half. And at that point, I just gave up and I stood up and I just tried to focus and, and said, this, um, this one's got me. I got, I'll, I'll try it again another time. I'll ask him about that. But that one got me. But it was that lesson right there that was one of those you know, tune in to a lot of these old songs, which is going to come in handy a little bit down the road or a lot down the road. Um, so I get through that. I'm always at wherever dad's church is. I am always the organist on call or whatever have you. But when I was a senior in high school, I got my first official organist job. I wasn't the choir director. They just said, come on in and you know, play, play the hymns and, and uh, 
you know, we'll have choir rehearsal or whatever have you. There's a choir director, you know, um, but it's pretty, it's pretty simple. Um, it's sort of an older church with an older uh, congregation. So they're not singing any, any big gospel songs. Um, they're not using any sheet music. They're pretty much using, um, you know, hymns that they can, uh, that they can adjust and ramp up, if you will. Um, they're using some old spirituals and things. And a lot of these songs I have learned because um, of being in my community growing up. And a lot of these songs are similar, which again, comes in handy a little down the road and I'll get to, I'm, I'm getting to it. So fast forward, I go to college. I uh, go to Berkeley College of Music for a semester. I quickly learned that Berkeley College of Music is not necessarily the place that you want to go to if you want to become a middle or high school band director. Um, <laughs> I learned that the hard way, but uh, I still I had good grades and I and I did you know did my thing. But um, after you know seeing just the atmosphere and knowing you know what I wanted to do and 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 you know looking up to a lot of band directors in our state and seeing how their programs were and everything and successful they were, um, I figured that I needed to transfer. And at first I was gonna transfer to Florida State University, but that was gonna be in the fall. That was when they said come in the fall because I missed the deadline to go immediately in the spring. Meanwhile, South Carolina State University said, well, come on, you know, you know, you can come immediately in the spring. So the plan was for me to go there in the spring and then transfer to Florida State in the fall. Um, that never happened. I got to South Carolina State and the atmosphere on that campus, the, the music department wasn't uh, as near as accomplished per se um, as Florida State's. It's not near as large. Um, there's not nearly enough resources or, or, or whatever. But something in me told me that that was the right spot for me. And I wouldn't trade that experience and that university over any other place that I had been looking at for anything. Because um, I just think that I got a lot of, of information from being there. Um, I, I joined all of these ensembles that I don't think that I probably would not have been able to do at one of these larger universities. Um, I was able to be in all of, the, all of the bands that we had at South Carolina State. Um, the, the choir director uh, was the late Dr. Arthur Evans. He was also the department chair. And Dr. Evans would always, every year, he would have a large concert where he would enhance the concert choir. And normally the concert choir was usually about 50 voices or so, but he would always do a concert uh, with the South Carolina Philharmonic and he would always ask for other music majors, instrumental majors, or anybody else, actually anybody else in the school that wanted to, to join. And you had a lot of kids that just had these natural, you know, really good singing abilities that would join and we would swell to about a hundred piece choir and we would be presenting these concerts. Um, um, we would always take a tour every, um, every summer and we would play in all of these, uh, all of these churches. Um, and we would do these, um, these, these performances that, that had both, you know, um, more so on the classical side um, and uh, a little gospel here and there, but um, I'd say it was about 90-10 with Doc, you know. <laughs> but that was a very good experience to have. When I left South Carolina State, I still wanted to be a music teacher and somehow I got mixed up in a ska band. And if you know what ska music is, that is literally the farthest thing to the left that you would probably think that Charlton Singleton was gonna be doing. And my parents said, you went to school to teach and you're gonna do what? 
you're going to ride around in a van with six other guys and 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 not know where you're going to be with no insurance and and you know all of this stuff and being good parents and everything and i said yep that's what i'm doing um just trust me on that we're you know we're we're going to we're going to go out and we're going to be big stars or whatever have you we were successful but it didn't turn out like we had hoped in 2000 i started teaching um like I was telling uh, some of them before everybody came on, um, I had quite the first year of teaching uh, elementary school music. Um, I spent a good portion of my time arguing with kindergartners um, about some of the craziest things. Um, uh, I even argued with a, a first grader and <clears throat> I'm still trying to figure out how I got on the topic of circular breathing with a first grader. Um, I, I, I still don't know how I came to that point, but in the end, when I told them that you had to breathe through your nose and out through your mouth and do it simultaneously and you can play that way, this first grader looked at me and said, why would I want to do that? I'd be scared a booger would go down my throat. <laughs> kid logic, kid logic, which I agreed with him, you know, so Fast forward, I'm getting more into performance and I have some good jobs teaching. I teach out at Lincoln High School uh, for a year. I teach at the Charleston County School of the Arts for five years. I'm doing middle school band there. Uh, but as all of this is happening, I am starting to get more into performance and it's starting to be sort of a 50-50 thing and then I'm starting to lean more to, I want to try this performance thing, but I'm scared. And my sister one day called me and she said, just go ahead and jump and the net will appear. And she said, we were raised always to have faith. So you've got a loving support system and you've got faith and that faith is going to take you to wherever you need to go. So just go for it. And so I decided to do that. And, um, you know, there was a lot of prayer and a lot of hard work and a lot of hustling and everything. Um, but the performance aspect started to come along. And then about five years ago, some old friends and I got together and we decided that we were going to start playing some music in a contemporary style that represented the low country. And that band is Ranky Tanky. And when we started looking at material, I said, well, actually, all of this material that we're talking about is really just the stuff that I grew up listening to at church. It comes back to church. All of these songs, whether it's, um, whether it's a song called That's All Right, um, which is uh, a staple in, in any of uh, those, those communities, 10 mile or four mile or six mile, you know, one, one other thing about those, 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 um, those uh, communities, all of them had at least one church in their community. And everybody in that community belonged to that church. Um, in four mile, it's Friendship AME Church. In six mile and seven mile, it's Garden of Prayer or Goodwill. And those churches are right on Highway 17, if you know anything about Mount Pleasant area. Um, what is it, the Fresh Fields that's over there? It's just down from them. I mean, you, you can't miss those, those churches. In 10 Mile, it was Greater Zion AME Church. Um, also in 4 Mile, it was Olive Branch AME Church. Um, so those churches, like I said, they all, um, they all had, or those, those communities, they all had a church and those communities were very steeped in their faith. That song, that's all right. You could probably go to uh, Friendship AME Church and someone would sing that song. Same lyrics, maybe a slightly different way than they sing it over at the other church in the other neighborhood, but it's the same song, which is different a little bit from the way they sing it at this other church which is a little bit different than the way that they sing it at this other church, but it's still the same song. 
Um, and so what this band does, Ranky Tanky, is we give a, you know, a sort of a new fresh coat of paint, if you will, um, and make it a little bit more contemporary um, to, uh, you know, uh, to the sound. When you think about the Gullah sound, it's basically your uh, hands clapping, your voice, and your feet. That's the original Gullah right there, which dates way, 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 way back, way back. Um, predates a lot of this popular music that we have today, whether it's jazz or blues or, or uh, country music, folk music. Um, Gullah predates all of that. So um, it's really an informant, to be honest with you. Um, that's just the truth. It's an informant to a lot of these different styles. Um, but being able to apply that music, that sound, and that faith into what we do is something that really was a marriage of that, that I could just never really would have imagined. Um, <clears throat> and when we go out and we perform, um, there's so many times where we are literally uh, having church on stage. And, uh, you know, I don't know if the, the crowd can, can tell, but when, when Kiana is singing, you know, Been in the Storm, or she's singing That's All Right, or we're singing um, the title track, Good Time, you know, that song is something that we would sing right after uh, we would experience, you know, the sermon. Good time, a good time, we gonna have a time. We gonna have a good time in the name of the Lord right now. We gonna have a time, you know? So all of it would basically just, just come around. And in the last few years, I've thought about all of these different situations and things that, that I've uh, experienced. And, 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 and I look back and I said, that was an interesting route that I, that I took to get to, to this point, but it was nothing but the Lord that actually put that in front of me to go that way. Whether it was me watching the Muppet show and pretending that I was whoever the guest was, um, you know, the, the musical guest, that prepared me, I think, for how I deliver something on stage. Um, uh, I would see, you know, people with, uh, with um, uh, a jump rope, you know, when I, I begged, you know, my cousin or, you know, sister slash cousin, Deanna, if I could borrow her, her jump rope one time, because the jump rope then made it so that I had a microphone with a cord. <laughs> Prior to that, it was the vacuum cleaner because the vacuum cleaner was just straight, you know, up and it was like a stationary mic. But then I got the jump rope and I got a cord. That was big time. But situations like that, I think, prepared me for the life that I am in now. Watching people at church and how they sang, watching the emotion that they would put into it, um, how they delivered their song, how the organist would play, how the organist would accompany you know, people that either brought in some sheet music for them or didn't bring any sheet music from them watching how the, the organist and the soloist would come in and would just say, just follow what I do, follow me. Uh, okay, um, but that's part of, that was part of my, my learning for that. Um, and so nowadays I've been able to combine both of those things with it, the performance aspect and that teaching aspect which is, um, has just been very rewarding. Recently, and um, thank you, Jennifer, for reminding me about this because I can share this now. Recently, I made a little video to show everybody just what we do with the band Ranky Tanky. Now, in this band, we, um, like I said, we interpret um, a lot of songs. Uh, the title of the of the of the song is Ranky Tanky. That actually means something. That means to work it or get funky with it. One of the things about the Gullah community that we have is that um, the idea of playing patty cake, where you clap on beats two and four, 
that is uniquely Gullah. And so plain patty cake, I'm sure everybody has done that before. You know, that game, Ranky Tanky, is one of those such games. Old lady come from Booster, had two hens and a rooster. The rooster died, the old lady cried, now she don't eat eggs like she used to. Paint in my head, Ranky Tanky, work it out. Paint in my hands, Ranky Tanky. Paint in my feet, Ranky Tanky. Paint all over. Now picture kids doing this because that's really what this is. It's a little kid's game. In its purest form, you have, like I said, someone singing it or saying it, reciting it, um, like spoken word, someone clapping and stomping their feet on whatever hard surface they could or, or just the ground. So with that, I made a little video of me doing that in this room. Hold on. Can everybody see that? Can you hear it? Basically what you do in church, the way that I grew up. Every Sunday, there was something like that. Maybe not that particular song, but that's basically every Sunday, as long as I can remember in my childhood years, that's my training. That's my training. Now we go from that to the interpretation of the song. Who is the greatest? We are the greatest. I'm sure. yeah. I'm still. Yeah. If you were to talk to Quentin Baxter, he would tell you that everything that he plays, it's, it's what he did at church. Um, it, it, it really all comes back around um, uh, to, um, to that, for me at least. And uh, my upbringing, uh, which I wouldn't trade for anything, um, and continued faith, you know, just in anything that, that comes my way. And uh, I, I'm one of those persons that, that really believes in um, things happening for a specific reason. And I might not know what that reason is until later on or figure it out until later on. Um, but I take that on and, and, and run with it. Um, so now that kind of brings us up to, to today. Um, I'm still playing at church uh, whenever I can still, whenever I'm in town, um, I'm, I'll, you can find me at, uh, at St. Patrick Catholic Church. Um, Jill's even sung up there. We did, what was it, a wedding that we did? 
Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, uh, it's always going to go back to church for me. Um, even, you know, I, I still get even picked on by my dad sometimes. He said, where are you going? You going to Canada? All right. You going to be home Sunday morning? You know, <laughs> you know so it's always going to come back uh, to that. Now, I, I just looked at the clock. Wow. Um, well, I was just going to mention we have <laughs> we have a few minutes left. And if the Zoom can go on a little bit longer, if people have to leave to get to a class, that's fine. But I have three questions from the chat that okay. that I would love to ask you on behalf of our people. Mm -hmm. So the first one is, do you feel a sense of responsibility to be the spokesperson for the Gullah community? as you travel the world with Ranky Tanky? Uh, yeah, I mean, anytime you, you go out and you talk about the community like we do, I mean, you have to have some responsibility for that. You have to have some um, responsibility or take responsibility for what you say. We've been very fortunate that, um, that everyone that we have encountered from our community have been very supportive from day one. Even as individual artists, they have been very supportive of us. When Ranky Tanky came along as, as the group, um, you know, they were like, yeah, go ahead and do your thing. You know, absolutely. Uh, one of the things that, um, that I like to talk about when we're in concerts or when we're doing um, workshops and things, is making folks or just um, making sure that they are aware that there are a lot of things from the Gullah community that they have come in contact with probably throughout their lives that they probably just didn't know that that was Gullah or Gullah was the actual, you know, root of it. Or, you know, for example, like the patty cake thing or, um, or the gasps in the audience when I say, you know, how many of you all have heard of the, the Kumbaya, that's probably the most recognizable Gullah song on the face of the earth. And they're like, oh, yeah, that does make sense. Or, or um, Michael wrote the boat ashore. Michael wrote a boat ashore was written on St. Helena Island, which is right down on the, the, the border of Georgia and, and South Carolina or Sweetgrass Baskets. Um, if you think about uh, different styles of music, how Gullah has influenced those styles um, from what we, from everything from spirituals and gospel songs. Um, um, you could, you can trace it to um, dance hall, reggae, you know, uh, just all kinds of stuff. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example of that. If any of y'all are familiar with dance hall, reggae, there's a certain sound, you know, to, to that. When we're in, when we're doing some gullah, you have the full clap, you have the half clap, you have the one clap. In dance hall reggae, there's usually a part where somebody might they they might they might be rapping and they'll say mix me and then you, you hear them do that. That's just the one clap. Really, that's all it is. And if you go back and look at your history of West Africans, you know, being brought to the United States and how it comes from the east side or the east southeastern part of the United States and then makes its way around through the Caribbean and over to New Orleans. Now, that's a whole nother subject of jazz and stuff that, you know, Mark will tell you, don't get me started on that. But to get back to your original thing, yes, we feel very responsible. We take that responsibility on. We love carrying that and we love talking about it. And we are supported by the community with that. The other part, the second part of that question is, does a sense of responsibility have influence on your song choices and arrangements? Yes, because one of the first things that we did when we talked about putting this band together and doing this project was that we wanted to make sure that we were still 
being respectful to the music and to the community. And the litmus test has always been, at least for Quentin and myself, our parents. And um, any senior member of our respective communities that know how we were raised, were there way were were there way before we even came here, you know, or got here into this world. And if it was okay with them, then we figured that we were on the right track. So um, definitely, that is always in the mix, even for new songs that we write. Um, you know, I'll look over at 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 Quentin or or Kiana and say. What do you think? You think mama gonna appreciate that? You know, and they'll give me their honest answer and we'll adjust accordingly if we have to. But there's always got to be that, that definite respect to the music and respect to the sound and respect to the community, yes. There's one more question in the chat, but hearing you say that, it makes me think how does that then evolve as we start to lose those elder members of our community? Well, um, with groups like ours um, or our group uh, going out and spreading that word, um, with there being more, um, more eyes now on, on the music, you know, uh, it, it, it always happens like that. Think about this. Um, when, uh, when Hootie and the Blowfish got very popular, there was all, all of a sudden this huge um, rush of, of uh, music execs and, and record labels that flooded the area looking for whoever the next Hootie and the Blowfish was going to be because they wanted to cash in on it. When the grunge scene started in Seattle, there was a huge rush to Seattle to see whoever the next thing was gonna be and to figure out what that sound is. Now, we're very lucky and blessed and we feel fortunate that we were able to win a Grammy basically. You know, that, that's, a, that's a big task. And one of the things that we said in our speech was that we were very thankful to the Recording Academy for finally, finally, after all of these years, finally just recognizing Gullah as a, as a type of, uh, as a sound, you know? Nobody outside of the Southeast really honestly knows a lot about Gullah. I mean, I had a man that came up to me when we were in Nebraska and he said, what do you call your music, goulash? And I said, no, sir, please don't say that. Please don't say that. Um, so uh, just the awareness of it, and we have in some people's mind, but I don't necessarily agree with this, put it on the map. We might have made it a little bit more commercial because of the, the success that it had on, on some, some charts or, you know, we can say stuff about, um, you know, Billboard and, you know, iTunes or whatever, and people are recognize that. And if you look it up, they say it's a Gullah band. Or, oh, what's Gullah? You know, and then you go down that rabbit hole. Um, so, um, that's our that's our thing right now. Just just more awareness. And anytime we can talk about it, we're gonna do that. Um, you still have groups that are out there doing it in its you know traditional form, like Ann Caldwell or the Plantation Singers, and you know locally and stuff like that. But you know, uh, ours is the one that's the contemporary version. Yeah. I started to talk before I unmuted. So we have one request if you would show the Grammy and the other a little, we can kind of see it behind your shoulder. But then another question about just the origins of Ranky Tanky a little bit more than what you already said. There it is. Look at that. Yeah. Um, 
I guess the actual I'm question the is, is clap. about. Wait a minute! What did it cut out? What? What? What are you saying? All right, said, let's listen again. I Jennifer, said that's what worth, you say? I said that's worth the Charleston clap. Oh yeah, that's a, yeah, <laughs> that's worth the clap, right? So um, the actual question was that somebody wanted to hear how Ranky Tanky first got started. So Clay on guitar, Kevin on bass, Quentin on drums, and myself. Back around 1999, we had a little band called uh, The Gradualine. And we used to play every Tuesday nights at this bar, which was then called Mezzanine. We would play every Tuesday night. We would have a packed house. It was amazing for a Tuesday night that we would play from 10, a, from 10 p.m. until literally about 3 a.m. But that was back when things stayed open. You know, King Street was way different back then. There were probably five or six bars between um, between Calhoun Street and Wentworth Street alone. Um, so we played together, we would do standards, we would do original tunes. And uh, long story short, Clay moved around 2001 or 2002 to New York City. We all stayed in touch, everybody was doing their own thing. Fast forward to about 2015, Clay got in touch with the four, with the three of us and said, nobody out there, I've been traveling all over the world, playing on all these world music festivals. No one's doing a contemporary version of Gullah. I see everybody else doing the music of their culture, the music of their state, the music of their country, whatever have you. Nobody's doing a contemporary version of Gullah. Why not us? And so we then started to talk. And like I said, you know, how are we going to do it? You know, is it going to be respectful? That's the main thing. Is it going to be something that we can be proud of? Is it going to be something that mama and daddy and aunts and uncles and everybody from our neighborhood and from the community can be proud of? That's the main thing. So we did a gig. We did like two gigs and it was sort of instrumental. And I think Clay may have sung uh, like two songs or something like that. And after those two gigs, we all said, this isn't going to work that way. We need a singer. Kiana, what are you doing? <laughs> we need a real singer. What are, you, what are you doing? And so Kiana came aboard and uh, we thought we were going to try to do, the, or the plan was to do like 10 to 15 performances a year because everybody was still doing their thing. Um, you know, Kevin was busy. Kevin was playing like five or six nights a week around town. Um, I was doing stuff with the Gill Yard. I was uh, at the time still with the Charleston Jazz Orchestra. Quentin was out on the road with Renee Marie and with Freddie Cole and Monty Alexander and all of these people. Kiana was still out really or coming off the road from being with Clay Aiken and stuff like that. So we decided to just do a few, but we did the showcase and we got about 30 offers after we did a showcase on a weekend. And by the time we got to that Wednesday, we had about 30 offers. And so that thought of 10 to 15 shows changed into reality of being about 60 shows that first year. And then luckily we got on NPR on um, Fresh Air with Terry Gross. And that was heard by about 6 million people. And that's really what started the snowball effect. And um, then we started playing some big festivals and and um, the name started to get out there. And then we released the second album and um, some people that were in our corner talked it into getting on the initial ballot. And uh, this is a long process before you get to the to the Grammy, uh, but it just it just you know kept going. And um, thank you, Lord. <laughs> 
Well, thank you, Charlton, for being here today. We so appreciate it. Sure, thank you. This has been fun. This has been fun. My my wife would tell you, she <laughs> she said, "What are you doing today?" And I said, "Well, I'm going to do a Zoom, you know, for uh, Charleston Southern." And she says, "Well, how long is it?" And I said, oh, "It's probably about a um, about an hour and twenty minutes or something like that." And she just went, "Oh God, you're going to talk for an hour and twenty minutes straight." Oh. <laughs> well we would love to have you back to talk for another hour and 20 minutes probably next year but all right deal yeah. deal all right. thank you so much Thanks, thank you all good seeing you all as always. You. all right bye